uh, we have to have a mindset. You know, the book of Habakkuk, the second chapter, it says, write the vision and make it plain. You have to know what you want, first of all. Uh, second of all, you have to be very disciplined. Also, when it comes to um, doing things for yourself without feeling deprived, you have to basically set a game plan and you have to stick to it. So if you can only afford to do, let's say for example, $50 to spare to do something special for yourself, you need to stay within the $50. We cannot dip and dive and dabble into our other means or other resources to uh, rob Peter to pay Paul. Uh, we have a bad habit of doing that in a lot of cases, but we must uh, exercise discipline. And one of the things I like to do is break finances up into categories. So. For instance, if you have $50 to spare, you set that $50 aside and have in your mind that you will only use that, hear me when I say that, only use that to help yourself and treat yourself to something. Also, you must have realization, you gotta be real with yourself, you gotta be honest. Remember, Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Don't go out there trying to buy a $500 pair of shoes and you know you can only spare $50. Trying to keep up with the Joneses, all right? Does that answer your question? Can I, can I add to that? I think one thing that um, Pastor's really good at, when we first got married, we talked finances, we talked what we wanted to do, we both like to travel. And so when we do our budget, we budget traveling into our expenses. And so we have an account that's just for travel. So if there's not enough to travel in that account, we can't travel. But if there's enough to travel in that account, then we can go somewhere. And we take an amount out of every check. Each time it gets paid, it goes into the travel account. So even with your hair, your ladies, you know, we want to make sure we're looking good. Budget your hair. Because, you know, that could be $100 a month for some people, $40 a month. Budget everything and stick to the budget. It's not good enough just to have a budget. You have to have the budget and stick to it. Budget your hair, your nails. If you want to grocery shop, if you, like you said, if you have $50 a month, maybe save it up for the next month. You can buy you a $100 pair of shoes, right? But you have to put that in your budget to say, hey, I deserve something because I work hard. But once you have to, you want to say, if you only have $50, only spend that $50. And don't put it on your credit card thinking I can pay it off. So don't put it on your credit card. What I like to do is whatever I put on my credit card, I know I can pay for it for my account. I use my credit card to get points, right? Um, so if I can get, you know, that's another way to travel. You can get travel credit cards, and you can use your credit card to pay bills that you would normally pay, and then you can get points for travel so they can help you travel cheaper. And also, I'd like to add to that. When it comes to, let's say, couples, uh, married couples, uh, you gotta be not, not be afraid to put your foot down, okay? If you want to get somewhere, you both have the same mindset. I'm going to be real with you guys today. Can I do that? Yeah. I can't talk with you. <laughs> if you have one individual, let's say in the marriage, that doesn't care about what's there, they want what they want, you got to say no. Okay? Say no. Oh, I didn't get it okay. You're not talking about me. No, I'm not talking about me. <laughs> I'm, I'm the frugal one. I'm, I'm the frugal one. <laughs> but you have to say no. You got to be disciplined. If you have a common goal in mind, goal in mind you have to stick with one another, understand that we're trying to get what we're trying to get, and not be afraid to say no. And if you're single, you have to not be afraid to say no to yourself in that moment, okay? Amen. Goes back to discipline. The one thing I do is um, to help me not spend my personal money, we have several accounts set up. We, I have a personal account, so if I want to go shopping outside of my personal account, the bill account is never touched. But for me, my, I don't have a debit card to my personal account, so if I want to go get cash out, I have to go to the bank to get cash out. I make it inconvenient. To feel like, oh, I need to have, oh, I gotta go all the way to the bank, go to the teller, get some. I don't have a debit card too. They keep trying to send me one. I say you no know, because that's another way I discipline myself. Is um, I make it inconvenient for me to have to spend money. And like, for I am the frugal one, y'all. Seriously, <laughs> yes. It's only three things I spend money on. Everything else I'm frugal. <laughs> She's telling the truth. I'm telling the truth. I, I'm gonna be honest. When we got, we did our engagement pictures. He went and spent sixteen dollars on a shirt, and I got me. fifteen. Well, fifteen dollars on a shirt. I was like, we could have went somewhere else and got a white shirt. You spent fifteen dollars. <laughs> I mean, y'all probably don't think I'm frugal, but I really, really am. <laughs> you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I'm sorry if I don't remember your name, but when you were talking, you mentioned about you, you don't use the debit card or, you know, a personal shopping, you use your something about My credit card. A credit card, yes, so that you can earn travel points. And you mentioned a travel card. So what I would like to know, I was talking with someone else about a week ago, and they said they had a travel card. So can you explain to us the travel card and which banks or 
how can we get offers travel cards and how we qualify for it? So I have a Capital One Venture card and I put um, any of if I shop on Amazon, everything goes on this one card. Once again, I only put on it what I can pay off at the end of the month. Um, and so you get points from however much money you spend. The more money you spend on it, the more points. But if you're gonna spend that money anyway, I know a lot of people that pay their mortgage with their travel cards because they're gonna pay it anyway. And the more money you spend on it, the more travel points you get for airlines, for flights, I mean for flights, for hotels, for rental cars. I know for my Capital One Venture, if I use that card to book my um, rental car, it comes with its own insurance. I don't have to, you know how the, the, the companies will say, hey, you want to purchase insurance? That's an extra $22 a day. You got the car for $16 a day. You know? And so I can say no to that because my Capital One Venture covers my insurance for any rental car that I get if I use that car to book it. So the more money you spend on the travel card, the more points you get. And so once again, I only spend what I know I can pay off at the end of the month so I won't be in debt. That's it. Even though we're using credit cards, try to only spend what you know you can pay off at the end of the month. That's so big, okay? You don't want to revolve in debt like that on your account. So Capital One Venture is a good one to start off with. And um, you, how you apply, you just go to Capital One. You gotta have a, I don't know what your credit score has to be, but make sure you got good credit. They may start you off small, and that's the one good thing about credit cards. Even if they start you off with 500 or $1,000, take it and start using it. Because if they see you hitting 500 every month and you're paying it off, they're gonna give you more money. If you have a credit card now, ask them to raise your limit. I ask them to raise my limit. Not that I'm going to use the limit, but I want to have that opportunity just in case an emergency comes. You want to have that. And so Capital One Ventures is a good one to start off with. Your earn points, girl, get you on that flight, get you on a cruise. <laughs> yeah. I know I love to travel. Now, uh, one thing she mentioned was the uh, accounts that we broke up uh, to, so since day one, let me say it this way, since day one, uh, we've established, and I want to, if you guys can write this down, this is something we teach all the time. We have four basic accounts that we started off with. Uh, that's a bill account, an emergency account, a long-term savings, and a leisure account. Uh, so what you do is you calculate how much your bills are per month, and I usually add 10% on top of that because, you know, certain bills fluctuate. So water bills, light bills, things like that, they change. Uh, so what you can do is have your direct deposit, you gotta have a job or some sort of income now, right? <laughs> and that money goes directly to those accounts automatically, all right? So that way you're automatically saving, you're automatically putting away for an emergency, so if your transmission goes out, water heater breaks, things like that, you have a place to pull from. Uh, that's, that's key. Remember, discipline is the key. And you also have a little bit of money going to your leisure. You only use your leisure for leisure. You do not tap into your bill account to take care of leisure, okay? And this is something that's big. I know we don't look at tight as this option or as a bill. Like, we're gonna pay tight. We're gonna pay tight. No matter what, I remember um, it was a time where I had lost my job, I was pregnant with our son, and pastor was giving, giving. And I said, well, you, you, you think you wanna calm down on your giving? He said, I, he said, I'm giving what God told me to give. That's right. And I looked at him and I said, yes, sir. And uh, it, it wasn't even that, I said, it was like, tight is mandatory. It was his offer, and I was like, oh, you know, I'm not working right now, you know? Um, but he said, I'm giving what God told me to give. So when we're talking about finances, the first thing we need to talk about is make sure you're tithing. Mm -hmm. God is not going to bless your finances if you're not tithing. Mm -hmm. And so make sure you tithe. That is so important to us. That's, that's, that comes out of our bill account, y'all. Because that's we, that we're so, that's so big to us. That's why we, we budget tithe. That's a, that's a, that's a line out of tithe. Yes, and remember, when it comes to tithing, you may say, oh, well, why am I giving? Uh, well, you know, in addition to being obedient to the word of God, God has allowed us through our government system for you to be able to write that off above a certain amount. Uh, so you can get tax credit for that, okay? So that's a, one thing you can do. So any contribution that you have throughout the year to your church or to a charitable organization, you can write that off on your taxes. Everybody do that? All right. I think it's, I think the threshold now, correct me if I'm wrong out there, brother, is it 5,000 or more? Mm -hmm. It's 10,000. 10,000 or more. 10, all right, 10,000 or more. Uh, you can write that off on your taxes, all right? Any questions in regards to that? I know it's tax time. Yes, ma'am. What were the four accounts again that you had? Oh, bill account, uh, emergency account, long-term savings, and leisure. And so in that bill account, when we say hair and nails bill account, mm -hmm. that's out the bill account. His haircut bill account, Sorry. groceries bill account, 
lights, water, gas, bill account, mortgage, rent, bill account. And the reason why our, our appearance is in the bill account is we felt like this is how we met each other. And we want to at least keep each other in the same way we met, right? And he doesn't want me go, to go lacking because I have $2 in my leisure account and I'm looking at a hot mess because I can't get my hair done. No, because so, she's a representation of me. Come on, preach, preacher. Right. Y'all get that? Did y'all get that? Right. We, got, we got a newly in the house. Y'all got your wife is a representation of you. Right. So if she looks a hot mess, I'm just going to say. Yeah, we must present them without spot or oh, week. Come on. <laughs> Crazy. So, um, so, so put that in your bill account because your appearance is important. You know, we know we go on our jobs, we want to put our best foot forward. Hair, nails, you know, whatever medical expenses are bill accounts. Um, so when you're doing your bill account, try to put as much as you can out in that bill account so you know that's gonna come out every month. And let the, we let those bills come out every month sometimes. So we don't, Cause sometimes you forget to pay. You, we go through stuff and now you're two months behind like, oh, I forgot to pay the one. Now instead of it being a $200 bill, it's a $700 bill. Y'all know, and then it's cold. Y'all know this is, this is a little heating right now going on. Okay. And remember, when you have these accounts automatically set up, uh, you can then free yourself up to put it on an automatic deduction without the fear of you being short on your bills. Because if you did your calculations correctly month to month, let's say your bills are, let's say $2,000 a month, and you put $2,500 a month in there, you know that you're always covered on the bills. So you never, ever have to worry about it, as long as you keep income coming in. Pastor, when do you touch your long-term savings? Never, unless we are in a big situation. Uh, but what I like to do, because these are just four basic accounts that we build upon, so you start off with the four, but maybe you have a threshold that you want to keep, you know, in your long-term savings, for instance. Let's say you want to save up $20,000. Well, once you reach the $20,000 and you haven't had to touch it, praise God. So what you do is maybe you take that money that you were dumping into that long-term savings and maybe you create something else to invest into. Hmm. Any other questions? You're, you're always expanding your resources, and if something goes wrong in life, you have a place to pull from. Amen, amen, any more questions? Any more questions? Yes. What would cause you to go into your long-term savings? I, I wouldn't, honestly. I, I strive, I, I'll cut back on everything else before I touch that. But um, what would it cause us, like a death? Oh, I mean, medical that, bills? Yeah, like a, a large medical bill, things like that. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll sell my shoes and everything before I do that. But don't forget, we have a short-term savings, too. Yes, short-term emergency savings. That's our emergency savings. That's when we tap in for, you know, somebody passes away and we got to, you know, pass the bucket. That's where that comes from. Because that's not a bill, you know? You right. never know that's going to come. And so, so, but it's also important if you use your savings that you put it back. Yes. Start trying to put something back. You know, we use our savings account to pay for some things and we still, okay, we got to pay it back now. Because we want it at a certain threshold. We use it, but now let's put it back. Right. Because life can happen sometimes. Yes. You know, things come up. But the beautiful thing about that system is you always have a place to pull from. You don't have to go get a payday loan. You don't have to go borrow from uncle so-and-so or mom or father or anyone. Uh, you have a place because why you've been disciplined over the four accounts. And those payday loans are extremely predatory. So yes. please try not to. Be, those interest rates are ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So please try not to get those. Those loans that say, you know, we can give you five hundred dollars now. Please try not to do that if you can, because if you'll pay, you'll end up paying like I think like they said twelve hundred dollars and five hundred. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yes. And uh, she mentioned the uh, bank thing. I wanted to touch on this. When it comes to uh, credit cards and credit and things like that, this one strategy I want to share with you guys. Uh, something I did when I first got out of college. You know how they offer sometimes those $5,000 signature loans and things like that. Uh, what I did, and I learned this from one of my mentors who's very wealthy, you have to create a relationship with your financial institution. So what I did, I didn't need the 5,000, but I took it. I borrowed the money, and when the first bill came 30 days later, I paid it all back with a little bit of interest. And the way I look at it is, so let's say that interest cost me $15, $20 on the $5,000 I borrowed, right? The way I look at it is, I paid $15 or $20 to establish a solid relationship with that bank. Yes. So then, when I paid all that $5,000 plus a little bit of interest back in the 30 days, they were more than willing to give me even more money. Mm -hmm. Next time around, it was $10,000. I took the ten. I put it in a savings account. When it was time to pay it, I paid it all back with the interest. Then. They said, okay, Mr. Williams, we'll give you 40000 I take it. I don't touch it. I just hold it. Then I pay it all back. Now I can go into the bank and they know me. Yes. I say, hey, let me get 100000 And they'll do it. 
It's all about relationships. But you gotta be disciplined. I keep going back to that. Don't touch the money. Don't touch the money. Like, it, look real, it looks really, 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 really good to have 40,000. Like, oh, no, don't touch it. And also, it keeps your bank uh, average up too. So when you stick that money in your account, your bank sees that, oh man, they have an average of 5,000 or 10,000 or 20,000 because you kept borrowing. They don't know where it came from or care where it came from. The thing is, it sits in there at a certain dollar value and you just pay it all back. Does that make sense? All right. I'm sorry. I got on the road there. I'm sorry. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> you guys. Yeah, one more. Oh, one more question. Yes. Uh, you know, you mentioned the different accounts mm -hmm. and I never thought about a leisure account, but I do have a tithing account. Mm -hmm. So when I semi-retired, I immediately transfer all you know online. But I also have an income retirement, so it's a security retirement income. I'm asking this question not to put anybody on the spot, but because of different opinions, if you might you know, not share to share your opinions. Some people say that you don't really have to tie on your social retired uh, social security. What's your opinion on that? They say because the reason why they say that is because they say, well, the years that you work, if you pay the tithe, which I did, you've already paid on that amount. Mm. But what I do, I find myself struggling now at this stage of my life with that thought. But I tied anyway. Yes, ma'am. I'd know what's your opinion? What would be pleasing and acceptable in the sight of God? Because he did say first fruit. He did. And that's an excellent question because you do pay your tithe initially building up all over those years. So I understand where you're coming from. Um, in that situation, I honestly would just seek God about it and do what he says. Uh, because, you know, if he, he understands that's a fixed income and, you know, I don't know your situation, but, you know, you did pay that up front if you were tied in on your gross. So I get where you're coming from. Uh, but I would seriously, honestly, do what the Lord says about it. I would ask him. And, uh, and in faith, I would probably still tie. She told you I'll give anyway. Uh, but I would probably still give. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I was always taught to tie on my increase. Mm -hmm. So if it's an increase that I wouldn't have had, I'm going to tie it on it. Yeah. Um, you know, we're not at retirement age yet, so we haven't had that discussion. Yeah. But my husband's going to still type, y'all. I'm going to still type. That's what I'm going to do. Um, question, is, is tithing hurting your bottom line? Okay. If it's, and here's the thing is, I'm telling you, God is going to bless you in that. And you'll see, you'll have more. Like, I, at one point, my income did not match my expenses. My expenses were more, and I couldn't figure out how every month they were paid. I don't know if I was the only person that ever had that. I'm a school teacher. Not that, you know, we're ranking number like 43 in the country. We don't get paid well. This is when I was single. My expenses were not, were more than my income, but because I tithe, God is going to bless that. And so I would rather tithe and not supposed to than supposed to and not tithe. And that's how I look at it. If I'm supposed to do it, I'm already doing it, thank you. If I, if I wasn't supposed to, if I already, I'm still doing it, I'm, I'm going to be blessed. I, I would rather be caught giving than caught not giving. You know, the reason why I ask that question, just in general conversation with people I know, and some things that have come across the media, I was somewhat floored by some people's opinion that, um, you know, no, you don't have to. And what really floored me, and, and I was talking to a personal friend. She do not even believe in the tennis. And I said, what? You know? All these years, she does not, she says, I first pay my bills. Well, I don't do that to this day. And I'm not perfect to this day. The first thing I do when I check my account, I immediately make that transfer into the tithing mm -hmm. account, and it's labeled tithing. But she, she says, no, I've heard several people say that, mm -hmm. and they're, they're Christians. They're not all churches, but main, main, main line mm -hmm. churches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, just, you know, I, I came a bills person, then, 
I do, you know, as nobody tells me what to do, and I thought, something's wrong with that, it seems like to me. And you know, typing is personal. And so I'm not going to get into an argument with somebody who, who doesn't or, or won't type. But for Holy Trinity, I'm going to let my pastor tell you the challenge he puts out to everybody. Oh, yes. At Holy Trinity, uh, for the past eight years now, uh, what we do for all faithful tithing members, every fifth Sunday, we've been doing this for eight years straight. Uh, if you're, as long as you're consistent, you receive $200. And, uh, we do a drawing. We do and we a drawing. pull somebody's name out until everybody has received. Every, until everybody has received, and we start over. Uh, so we do that as a faith move, the one challenge I always put out here uh, because I've been tithing for a long time, actually since I was about seven, eight years old uh, because of what my parents taught me. Um, I challenge people this uh, at Holy Trinity. If you don't believe in tithing, do it for one month. And if God doesn't bless you, I will personally give you all of your money back. So it's a win-win for you either way. I've never been taken up on that challenge because I believe God just that much. And he's put, he's put that same challenge out for eight, eight years. years. And if no you're new, if you don't believe in tithing, just do it for one month. Mm -hmm. Do it for one month. And we just have so much faith in God that God is going to show himself mighty in that one month. Mm -hmm. That you're going to want to keep doing it. Or he'll give you the money back. Or you get your money back. According to record, now you just can't tell me you tithe 10,000 and, and, you, and we have on record you did 400, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's about what's on record. <laughs> and that's how it is for our fifth Sunday giveaway is you have to, you know, give on record. Um, the rules are... Um, you have to be a consistent type parent to Holy Trinity. It doesn't matter if you're only paying, you only make $100 a month, you pay to whatever your type is. You, you know, make sure you put your name on the envelope. Pastor and I are exempt. We cannot win. We cannot win. Um, all names are drawn. And we don't say this person gave so much in type. We don't say that at all. I don't even know about the finances. Because I'm, I'm the youth person in the first lady. I'm, God going to bless the finances. I don't, and so I don't ask. So he's going to say, what about me? I don't know. I don't know anything about the money. I don't. Um, and so, once you pull your name, it's some, one time it took us, what, two years to get everybody's name? Like, but you're, you're guaranteed that your name will get called. And sometimes you do two and three in a day. Mm -hmm. On the fifth, every fifth, so our, our church loves for Sunday. Four in a day. We did four? We did four. Oh, we did, so we so we did four. We did four. So we gave about $800 on Sunday. Past, our past this Sunday. Mm -hmm. But if you're tithing as a couple, we give it to the household, not per person, like right. for the household. And, uh, and what that's done for our church is it, it has increased the amount of time because they see, oh my goodness, I can really be blessed through this. And then on top of that, see, it's not about, from our perspective, it's not about them getting the 200. It's about encouraging you to do what God said. And then the 200 is just encouragement. But what I really want is for God to show you who he is in a mighty way. So that's what the purpose behind that is. Going in. Who don't it's not even it's not even an auction. You're gonna get it. You're gonna get it. You're gonna get it. Can I can I hold two people? Can they attest to that? You gonna get it. You gonna get it. And I, I promise you, it always seems like your name gets called when you're like, man, I need somebody. But I, I, you're like, oh Lord, I need it. I need it. We, I mean, we don't know what you're going through. Sometimes people, are, you know, they don't tell anybody, but it always seems like when they need it the most, their name is called and they get two hundred dollars. That's two hundred dollars, and it's either to your cash app or cash in your hand. We don't, we don't. It, it's real, and we give it out. The day is full, we give it to you. If you're not there, you're gonna get a cash app. Because that's how much we believe in tithing, and so this is a financial workshop. But we're saying, thank God, and feel the Holy Ghost. We believe in tithing. I know all the pastors can say amen to that. Amen. All right. All right. Move this out. Help more people here. We had any, any more questions? More questions? Move this out of the way. This is in the um, shop, Pastor. Um, any more questions? I want to talk about uh, when it comes to finances before you get married. I know some people that's a huge conversation. I know for me at least. But you know, before you get married, what are some conversations that you need to have with the deal breakers? Oh, you definitely need to talk about it. Oh, yeah. That's for sure. I, I'm telling you right now. And, and have an honest conversation about it as well. You need to um, make sure. You fully discuss that uh, because, as you know, a lot of couples argue over money. Yeah. But when you go into it with an understanding and the truth, don't just say what you think they want to hear. That's the number one say, reason for divorce. Right. Money. You got to talk about it. Uh, so you should talk about who should handle it or what, whether should be together or something. What your debt is before you get married. Right. Like, don't go in there all rosy eyed. Right. What is your debt? <laughs> how, how much of money is student loans do you owe? <laughs> how much is your car loan? So we had the we had the tough conversations early, um, and we said early he was gonna be the person that handled everything. I'm frugal, 
But this is what he did for a living. He had those multi-million dollars. Why would I not trust him handling it? The little bit that I was given, you know? And so, but I think what God blessed us, God blessed both of us to make moves early. As a single woman, I bought a house at 23, 24. And I was able, we were able to make moves from that. We still own the house and rent it out. And that goes into a whole separate account, but we didn't talk about that account. Yeah. So the, the four account thing, remember, that's just a basis or a foundation to start upon. Uh, if you keep diligent and stay diligent and continue to make moves, you can end up with 20 accounts down the road. Rental property accounts. Rental property accounts, uh, equity accounts, all of these different things. Uh, so this thing has layers to it, uh, but it's about being diligent. So when you're talking, you you know, talking to your, before you, I guess you're engaged now, or if you have a, a significant other, mm -hmm. what do you see, what do you see yourself at in five years? What does saving look like to you? Do you like to travel? How much money do you spend on shopping every month? How much money do you spend in groceries? How much money do you spend going out to eat? <laughs> when I tell you, how much do you spend going out? Because that's big, and especially for the men, I'm going to say this, because 99% of the time, the ladies expect expecting you to pay. So if you start dating somebody, you're going out to eat one from twenty dollars to twenty-five dollars, getting yourself to allow sixty dollars because she don't want maybe an appetizer now. You know, he was like, "You got expression when I got a girl." I was like, "Yeah." Yes. <laughs> because you gonna come, you gotta come over. <laughs> you know, so, um, so exactly, how much is your card note? How much? And even for us now, we, we sometimes look at the account like, "Oh, we ate out too much this month." Like we even say that, like we need to, you know, we need to buckle back down. Mm -hmm. Even though we're blessed, we still now we ate out way too much because we look at the account. Chick-fil-A, my son went to McDonald's when he get off out of school. We went to uh, Panera Bread. But, I mean, I know for us, so non-negotiables are, one, well, you're not tied to bed, you can't, for real, that was a big nana. But thank God you were saved already. So not tied to this, I mean, but for real, for real, not tied to this is a non-negotiable for me. Because that means you're not trusting God and believing his word, what he's gonna do financially. So what is another non-negotiable for you financially? Let's see. Oh my goodness, where do I begin on that? Oh, God. just one, Pastor. That's one. That's one. Now he's not talking about me. Don't be it. So y'all gotta feel awkward. It's not me. For me, a big one, and this is a multifaceted thing, is not walking in agreement. And that covers many things. Yes. Um, because remember, one can chase a thousand, two can put ten thousand in flight. Uh, so you gotta walk in agreement. And if that is not happening, don't ignore the red flags. And don't be afraid to walk away. Woo! That walk away. That walk away is important. Um, another another um, thing when you're talking about dating, do they have children? Mm -hmm. Have they put away for how much are they paying in child support? Mm -hmm. Are they paying child support? <laughs> I promise you, if I dated a man that had children and didn't believe in paying child support, why would I procreate with him? <laughs> he already not taking care of his kids and his responsibility. You know, um, so so if he has children, is he paying? Does he take care of his kids? I also looked at how he. How he took care of his parents. How he looked out for them. That's big to me because although my family is not here, how he treated his parents was important to me. Because that's going to show how he's going to treat my parents. And me, you're right. If, he's made, if he makes sure, he, and he's always made sure his mom and dad were good. Always. And I always knew that, like I said, I, I questioned, I, and I only had that one question that one time about tithing. Once he told me God said it, I shut up. My mother would say, you got to stay to be quiet. She preached that last week. I was like, okay. <laughs> if God said do it, and we weren't broke. We just didn't have the money like I used because I wasn't working, and I was pregnant. Um, but not realizing that God was allowing me to have a good pregnancy and be off with my son. I didn't see that until later years. I'm like, God, why am I not? Because yeah, my job was stressful. I was traveling so much. We don't know what could have happened. But um, so make sure you have, are they paying bills? What, what, what are their, what is their debt? <laughs> Going in, we knew what each other's student loans were and what the plan was. You have to know that. You have to know what his debt is. Does he, is he, does he spend frivolously on cars? Do you spend frivolously on shopping? Like, go back to your account, and, and just last month, I'm not going to say December, because y'all know it was Christmas time when we were shopping. I ain't going to say December. But January, go back to your account and put everything you spent, and see how much you spent on shopping. See how much you spent on Amazon, ladies. Man, we love Amazon. And ask him to do the same thing. You know, one, the person who did our marriage counseling, we talked about was Bishop Perkins. He was, he was the superintendent at the time. And I didn't want my pastor to do it, and he didn't want his pastor to do it, because that was his dad. 
So he went to like a neutral person that was my superintendent at the time. That was Bishop, uh, Bishop Perkins. And he talked, he's like, did y'all have the money talk? We said, yes, sir. Yes, we did. So he asked us, y'all talk about this? Yep. Yeah. So whoever does your marriage counseling should also ask you about your finances too. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to tell you the brief testimony in the midst of all that when she talked about us tithing in the midst of, at the time she wasn't employed and pregnant, we closed on a new home. We had two houses. Two mortgages. One income, two mortgages, and we still didn't lack anything. We had to choke back on some leisures, but all the necessities never, ever missed, faltered, lacked anything. And it wasn't too long that we put our house to rent that it got rented. And to this day, it's been rented out 12 years now. And that's, and that's because he did what God told him to do. And, he, and ladies, sometimes we think we know everything. Mm. But we got, as, a, as a wife, I had to, you know, he's the head. God's going to tell the man some things that he's not going to tell me. And I'm not going to understand it. But I have to say, if that's what God said, do it. I know First Lady Princess can say it like, he said, but how much is it in the church? Okay. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean man, that we go around saying, well, I'm the man. Right. This is me. Do what I tell you. Right. No, 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 no. Right. Remember, I talked about walking in agreement. Yes. All right? Yes. So, if, as the leader, you still should communicate yes. to those that follow you, hey, yes, this is the game plan. This is what I prayed about. Yes, I want your feedback. <laughs> and listen, but if it deviates from what God said, then that's when you. Yes. Pull the trigger, but yeah. still include your yeah. life. Because okay. she, she can save your life sometimes too. Because right. sometimes women, y'all know we know how to pinch a little something. We always know how to, um, and we can say, hey, babe, what about this sugar? What about this shirt? Or what about versus this? Shirt? Like, I said, when I was mad, we spent fifteen dollars. I was like, I could get that shirt for eight ninety nine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, that, that was what seven, sixteen years ago, yes. and I still talk about it to this day. <laughs> But I am the frugal one. Y'all, even when I make, even when I travel and make the first, I think the first time he points out. Our honeymoon, <laughs> I'll tell the story. So we're getting ready to go on our honeymoon, right? To Fiji. And you know, that's a long ways away. It's over by New Zealand and Australia. So for me, my mindset is, I'm very financially conscious, I don't get me wrong, but when it comes to life experiences, and if I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it right. My grandfather always said, anything worth doing is worth doing right. So we planned, and I found this really nice resort that was about one year old, and uh, you know, it was a few dollars, and my wife, being frugal, she found this other resort. <laughs> and I said, I'm not staying there. You can stay there and come visit me at the other resort, because that's where I'm going. All right? I said, I'm not flying 16 hours to stay in a mediocre place. I'm not doing it. I'm not getting off of a plane cramped just to be uncomfortable for nine days on the other side of the world. I'm not doing it. So, needless to say, we, we got the place that I recommended. And when we got there, we were on this bus, and if you've been to different resorts in different countries, they put you on one big bus and go by the different places, right, until you get to your destination to drop everybody off. Well, guess what we pulled up to? <laughs> we pulled up to the place that my wife initially wanted to go to, and it was called the Outrigger. Y'all yeah, remember that Martin episode when he had to fight that red? Yeah, it looked just like that. It looked just like that. And it was in the middle of nowhere with a McDonald's across the street and a 10 foot high concrete wall around. It didn't even have beach access. And so when we pulled up, I said to her, I think this is your stop. I said, you wanted to stay here. And then, and she, did, she did that right there. She was like, and then when we pulled up to our place that I recommended, I said, now this is what I'm talking about. It was beautiful. They were playing the drums and meeting yes. us and, and their native languages and all of this thing, and it was wonderful. Yes. So, hey. Because I listened to him, y'all. Because <laughs> he knows I could be, I'm, I'm doing better now. I'm doing she better is. when we travel. She is. Um, and even because we stayed at that one resort, this, the, the work was there. We were the first African Americans they ever saw in person. So they took us back to where they lived at because they were so happy to see us. We were there for seven days. So we flew out on a Sunday and got there on a Tuesday. That's how long, we, but the, the, you, you lose a day or gain a day, lose a day going there. Yeah, you cross the international day. And so we got there on a Tuesday. We stayed until Tuesday their time. But the workers fell in love with us. And they kept saying, Bula, that means welcome home because, you know, if you don't, Samoans are African too, right? And so they took us back on 
We rolled the city bus to where they lived at, sat on the floor, they cooked food in the, with the banana leaves under the ground. We got the real Fijian experience because I listened to my husband and then stay at the Outrigger. <laughs> right? So we stayed at the New Radisson and it was just an amazing experience because I, I listened and I, we, we had the money. Oh, we need to go back now. I, we, were, we were a little bit more broker than him. <laughs> we went. But we went, y'all. But no, so no, we know now we would have went to Australia and we didn't know it was that close. So if you're gonna travel, do your research. I know for my birthday, for my 40th birthday, he did his research. We were able to hit three, you know, three countries because we're all the, the hardest part is getting to where you're gonna go. Those flights within the little areas are cheap. Yeah. But get from America to New Zealand, get from America to Fiji, or get from America to Europe. If you're going to go to Europe, you might as well see Paris, London, Spain, do all of that. And remember, the Bible says that people perish for the lack of knowledge. When you do your homework, when you do your research, for instance, when she's talking about the trip we went on, we went to Thailand, Bali, and Dubai. Well, if you do your homework, you'll understand currency and how it works. So one U.S. dollar in Thailand is worth 30 plus dollars. So we took 1,000 U.S. dollars and got 40,000 of their dollars. Did three cities. And when I cashed the change that I had back in, I got $800 back. After three cities, when we went to Bali, one U.S. dollar is 14,000 Indonesian rupiah. We took 100 U.S. dollars and got 1.3 million dollars. Yeah, I was a millionaire for a minute. <laughs> So this is the thing, we have to do our homework, we have to do our research. So when we get over there, we took flights from city to city, for both of us, $30. You know, things like that. So when you educate yourself, you will be able to live in the abundance that God has promised. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. All right, awesome, awesome. I think you guys covered, okay. <laughs> Strategies to live well. Uh, financial marital bliss. Thank you for the roadmap of the, the four different accounts. And, oh, how do you do it with one of you if you were um, counseling in pre-marital or in marital um, counseling? How would you counsel me if one of us had like an impulsive spending habit? How to get that out of control? <laughs> well, that's where the leisure account comes in. And you have to come into agreement that I'm gonna stick to what's in that account and that account only. And that should satisfy you know, the urge. Uh, so you can get something out of there, but you better not touch the other ones. And so we have our separate leisure accounts. Right. So it's not like if I spend a leisure, he can't spend it. We have, he, I don't know what's in his, he doesn't know what's in mine. Oh, you have a his and hers. A his and hers leisure so account. So she can spend at her leisure. She wants a purse, shoes, or whatever. If it's, it's in that account. Leisure. And so that's, and I mean, sometimes we all have impulses buying. Like, yeah, I'm in, these, I'm in this group that has all these deals. Stuff, stuff I don't even need, but it's like $6, let me go get it, right? Um, I don't know. Um, it's, I mean, but sometimes it's stuff for the house. Sometimes. Sometimes it's stuff for the house, I don't know. Um, but, huh? It's, I, I'll put you on, I'll tell you, I'll let you know. Yeah, I'm serious, like, it, I, I, and I find deals, and Sister Stephanie know. Sister Stephanie know, I find, yeah. for us to be as blessed as we are financially, I promise you, I still live like I'm a single school teacher sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a good thing. And he always tells me, you know what? Thank you. Because it's only it's only three things I spend a lot of money on. <laughs> you care to share? <laughs> Trips, vacation. Thank God for that. She didn't want to do that at first. <laughs> I didn't. I was trying to be cheap. I like to travel. I like to experience life. I know First Lady likes to travel too. We like to be on the beach. Hey. <laughs> get me on a beach with a book. Yeah. And for me, give me some crab legs. I'm good. Okay. All right. Shoes and purses. Those are the three things I will spend more money on. Everything else, y'all, I'll go to AliExpress and get my convocation outfits. You, you can get, it's called a, a, a shop called AliExpress, it's from China. But you better order nine you months You better order <laughs> It's too low, for real. So I'll start, I'll order my convocation stuff in September. I'll spend $200 and I have everything I need for convocation, six, seven dresses. And y'all know I try to look all right, try to dress nice. I just, I mean, but sometimes I'll go to the business to support, but I can't fathom spending $120 on a dress I saw on the website for $32. I know it's going to take you two months to get it. <laughs> but in my head, I still like, what? But I will support some people that I know. I bought stuff that I know I could get this cheaper, but I'll do it to support. 
But that's part of my impulse. I have that money in my leisure. So my bill account is never, ever hindered if you have an impulse. But when you're talking to somebody, make sure that it's a certain amount going from, from the account, from our, from our check. The, mom, the money goes to our leisure accounts, every check. I think it's my check that goes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Whenever I get paid, one of us gets some leisure. Because I'm a school teacher, get like two checks a month. One month, one month. Like I put it out of my account every the 15th and the 30th. It gets yes. I get it. So it's really important that you budget for leisure. <laughs> budget for leisure. Y'all know, know we like shopping. Y'all know, I mean, if you like shopping, that's okay. You want to have, you want to live a life. God said that he wants to have life and have it more what? Abundantly. <laughs> you know, and I tell you, it's crazy. You know, people look at my first Mercedes, y'all. I got on eBay. For $13,000. I went to my credit union, asked for a loan. They gave me a loan. I went on eBay. It was out of Boca Raton. It was this guy's wife's car. He bought her a new one. It was pristine. I told everybody thought Jeff bought it for me because we had just started dating. Um, Don't buy no cars while you date. <laughs> that's, that's the message. <laughs> so, so people think that, oh, she would not $13,000 for a Mercedes? I did that because now, now that you're in one, it's, they keep, you know, it's easy to stay in them. And so, Y'all don't be as afraid to look at places like eBay. Our place we like to go to is off lease only. Like we, well, we're not going to get it out of our means. Like I know, I know what my dream car is. Could we afford to get it? Probably. Yeah. But now it's not the right time. We need to. I tell them we need to make some other financial moves. So it's okay to have dreams, but don't go living outside your means. I I know what my dream car is. I know how much it costs. It's now. It's not the time. Do I think I'm gonna get it? Yeah, because God is good to me. Because if I delight myself in the Lord, it says he'll give me the desires of my heart. And he has so far. He may not give it to you right then, but he's given it to me. And so, make sure you have that. It's, if you have leisure, you're good. If you budget, don't do anything that's not inside your leisure. Yep. Don't touch it. And I'm sorry if I'm getting ahead, sis. But uh, as she's talked about, you know, uh, he'll give you the desires of your heart. In the book of Luke, the 16th chapter, I think it's the 10th verse, he talks about he that is faithful in the least will be faithful over much. And if we want God to elevate us and bless us and trust us on the next level, we got to take care of where we are right now. Amen. So you, if you want to have a Ferrari or Coenessi or a Pagani one day, you should look that up if you don't know what that is. Uh, if you want to have one of those vehicles one day, you got to take care of the Honda Civic you have right now. Get the oil changed. Keep the tires rotated. Keep it washed, vacuumed, clean. He's talking about me now, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying this, uh, just as a testimony, um, see, I went through, uh, I didn't buy my first car until after college when I started my career. So I went through college when I went on a date, female had to come pick me up, okay? Uh, but the thing is this, I was diligent and I was, I was steadfast. So when, what happened is when I first graduated college, my grandparents let me borrow their old, old Volkswagen Golf. I had to start the thing up with a screwdriver, all right? Uh, some of y'all don't know about that. But, but what I did was I vacuumed that thing, I washed that thing, I, I went next to the windows, I even all all the little raggedy tires on it. But I rode that thing like it was a bed. Right. But then when it came time for me to buy my car, the Lord blessed me to buy a $35,000 car for $13,000. And that was my first car. My first car. And since then, I've been able to buy it whatever kind of car I wanted to. Now I chose, like she said, there's a time and place for everything. Just because I was able to do it don't mean I did it. Just because I can't afford to go buy a $150,000 car doesn't mean I go do it, okay? All right, sometimes you gotta use wisdom, all right? But the thing is this, God saw fit to trust me with something greater because I was faithful over the few. So if you're in a one bedroom apartment right now and you decide to live in a 10 bedroom house, take care of the apartment. Amen. 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 You got to be faithful in the least if you want to be have much. Amen. 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 Yeah, you have anything? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? Yeah. <laughs> so, switch you to if you have, how do you look at using? Let's say if you have equity in your home or you mm -hmm. have investment accounts. Yes. How do you make moves to like I think I heard one of you say, well, you took one investment and used it to invest something. When and how do you know when to do that? Oh, I love equity. Equity to me is worth more than 
cash itself in savings accounts or whatever. Uh, the beauty, beautiful thing about equity, let's say if your house is worth, let's say $500,000, um, and you owe $200,000, so that's $300,000 worth of equity, the financial institutions will only finance you and give you equity up to 80% of whatever equity you have. So 80% of $300,000 is a couple hundred thousand and change. Uh, so the thing is, what I do is you have to, again, discipline. My thing is I vow to never ever use my equity on foolishness. I always buy other assets with my equity. Hence, property, things like that. Things that are gonna gain value. I personally don't believe in buying a car with my equity. Amen. It's a depreciating asset. Yeah. So the first time we used our equity, we bought a condo. Cash money. Cash, that we own a condo now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because our neighbor told us, hey, it was what, 32,000? It was, it was uh, 36 at the time. 36,000 for a whole condo that's our, always rented out, always. And there was a bid war on it, and because we had the cash and equity, mm -hmm. uh, well, the, yeah, we had the cash and equity, we offered 39 and beat everybody. Cash, cash no, no finances, because no we finances. had it. So what he was saying is, so you can pull out and get an equity loan and not touch the money. Mm -hmm. right. So you have $100,000 cash sitting there, and now you can make moves. You know, um, find you somebody that you trust that's flipping houses. Mm -hmm. Start small. What if I give you ten thousand? Says that's how much would you give me back? Somebody that you trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us, we knew her. She she was actually the property manager for our other property, and so she was like, "I got a property for y'all." So now she manages two of our properties. Mm -hmm. And then so now we're trying to get out some more that's and right. get another piece of property. Right. Now we we want to retire and just chill and live life chilling. Yeah. And the reason why I like buying only assets with the equity is this. So someone may say, oh, but that's more debt. Yeah, but it's smart debt. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, I take $100,000 worth of equity and I go buy a, a house with it, and that house becomes valued at $250,000, and then I, now I have equity in that house. Mm -hmm. And then I take the equity out of that one and go get another house. Now I got equity in that house too. So what it is, is it's about debt management. But you're building wealth in the process because you're buying things that are gaining value. Uh, so if you ever even get in a tight spot financially, I can just go back and liquidate the asset that I bought. So if I need, uh, I got $100,000 that I got to pay right away, I'm going to sell that house or I'll pull the equity out of that house and pay the $100,000 worth of debt. So you only buy assets with your equity. Would you buy right now houses? houses? <laughs> buy houses right now, it depends on the deal. Me personally, this is my strategy. I like, I like to wait for the dip. So what I do in the days of, of plenty is like now, uh, you know, where everybody's making money and, and the economy is somewhat still stable right now, I like to just build and I aggressively pay down my debts right now. And then I access my equity and I wait for the sale. So when the market crashes, I go shop. I buy everything on clearance. <laughs> when that condo... That's when he's frugal, y'all. Yeah, that's when I'm frugal. <laughs> so the condo in today's market might be a hundred plus thousand dollars, but when the market crashes, it's dropping below 70000 Then I could say, give me two of those. That's how I... And then you rent them out. Mm -hmm. And that rent pays for that equity loan. That's right. So it's not coming out your pocket? Someone else is paying that off. Someone else is paying that off. Like the, the house that I bought, somebody's living in it. They're paying their mortgage for us. Thank you. Sir. People, you know, people, if you have a house, somebody's calling you every day trying to buy your house. I don't know if we, we get those calls every other day um, to try to buy your house. And I said, no, it's a rental property. You got something that you want to sell? Like, I, I have to go back on that. <laughs> I mean, so we, it's, it's just, the thing is, looking around and doing your research. That's the most important thing is doing research. Because there are people that are, are they want to scam you. And that's sad, but there are people that want to take your hard-earned money. Mm -hmm. And do your research, but get that line of equity early and just sit on it. Yeah. Uh, you don't, you're not paying anything on if you don't put anything out. That's right. Amen. So it just sits there. So you have access to $60,000 just sitting there. So when it's time to make the move, let me just write you a check. That's right. Readily available. One thing, yeah, one, so yeah, one selfish thing we did with our equity was, what do we do? We go. Yes. We built a pool in our house. We did. I mean, because, and this is the first thing he asked me, he said, is this going to be our forever home? And I looked at him and I said, yes, we're not moving again. And then, because we really wanted a pool. So we built a pool. And when you're telling somebody, I'm not financing, well, I'm paying you cash, you can negotiate. Yes, you get a better deal. Like, like to the car, hey, no, nah, the car may be 42000 I got 36 or 35 cash. You going to do it? Mm -hmm. I got cash right here. You want it or not? They'll take it. Put 35 cash in their face. 
Who gonna walk away from that? Yeah. So it gives you that cash buy option, and uh, and it's always better whether it's property or whatever it is. You can, you know, I don't care what they tell you. If the property is listed at fifty thousand dollars and you come up with forty thousand cash, and they haven't gotten many bites, they'll take them for it. Yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah, they are. That's how we got our house. People, when I, but God bless. I'm trying to. He listened to his wife, and I'm so thankful for that. God told me a number specifically. I said our house is under this amount of money, and he was like, he, he, got, he looked at me like, and I said, God told me. He's like, okay. Yeah. So we look at the house we had. It was on the market for two hundred. Was it two hundred thousand? Mm -hmm. I said, Jeff, offer this. He said, what? I said, offer this. Yeah. And this was when the market was in the toilet. So that's why I said, offer this. And I knew what God told me. And they accepted the offer to the point the lady who is our property manager said to us, if I would have known they would have took that little, taken that little amount of money, I had cash buyers. Mm -hmm. Wow. So when you're doing research, pray. God, I, am I, God gave me a number. All right. Like, uh, am I am I lying? And I, it true. was the and I and I and I heard I'm like God really. Yep. And the houses we were looking at was over that number. Yep. Every house, and I'm like, it's not our house. I know what God told. Me. I was right. getting aggravated. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> we looked at a lot we of houses. At, uh, we looked at physically probably fifty plus homes, 50 and online we looked at a couple hundred. <laughs> I know what God told me. Yeah. Drive it all over. <laughs> I was like, just pick one. <laughs> pick one. I'm going to change it anyway. <laughs> but here's the thing is we were in agreement on it. He was, even though he didn't really, he was like, okay. Just like when God told him, keep giving at that amount. God told me the number. And because we went, so the God told me this number, we went even 10,000 under that number. I said, offer that number 10,000 under. He was like, well, I said, I, and so because we got it, I said, now that you did that, I'm going to give you the $10,000 that we're going to spend so you can renovate the house that you want. Oh, and I went to town. I went to town. He went over, y'all. I'm going to get you. <laughs> but it's nice. But it, it's nice. If anybody in our house, God is good. And uh, we were able to get it. And, like, but I tell y'all, like I told you that the house was on the market for 200 and that's not what we offered. This lady, two day, or three days ago, who lives down the street for us, put her house on the market for $533,000. I said, babe. Look, 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 man. Look, look, look. And he was like trying to get some more equity. <laughs> Notice I didn't say sell. No, not, no. I said get equity. Because that's our forever home. Mm -hmm. And so when you're doing your forever home, it's okay to splurge a little bit on you because we work hard and we want our home to be peaceful. And so what we splurged on was I call it a modern oasis. Yes. In my backyard, mm -hmm. you can open it up and it looks like a modern oasis. Because I work from home sometimes, he wants to be, you know, he wants to be at peace. We want to just sit at home, at home and cut the pool line on and listen to some music. Because we deserve that, because God said that. He said, I give you desires of your heart. And one of his desires is to make his home his, his palace, right? Make your home. And so we budgeted and we, we were able to do that because we made the moves early. It's so important that you meet the person that's making moves like you make. He didn't know he was going to be the girl that had a house already. And so when we got married, it was financially sound for him to move into my house first. I already owned a home. And the first thing he said was, if you won't have a problem with you calling this your house. Absolutely. I, we had that discussion. We had that discussion. Talk about discussion. Yeah. And, we mean, had that discussion. Cause, and, cause, and that's the thing. And for me, that's, that's good. Right. Because you know, I was more than capable. I actually had a, a quarter million dollar yeah. pre-approval already when we, before we had that discussion. So I could have bought my own and I asked her, is it going to be a problem with me being the head of house in your and house. moving your house that you already had? Because if it is, I'll buy the house first, then marry. Mm -hmm. So, you know. And uh, what, what did I say first? Well, I don't know. I ain't never had a man living here before. Right. You know, in my house, I wasn't shacking up with nobody, right? <laughs> but y'all, he came in and started paying bills. <laughs> and he started paying <laughs> some oh, let me tell you. Then he put some wood flooring down. I said, oh, yeah, this is our house. This is our house. <laughs> This is our house. So, but, but because of that, but because we were, and think about it, the house that I had, um, I think I only paid 108 for it, because it was, it was years ago, right? So we were, and I'm paying that on a teacher's salary. He came in, of course, he makes more than I knew, so we were able to stack up and save. And so he already had that loan approved, so he, but let's say, he's like, you know, we're not living here forever. 
I was like, I know that. Let's, let's save some money and get a bigger house. And that's what we were able to do because we had already talked about money. We had talked about where we wanted to go. Let's live here for four years and save some money so we can have a down payment on the house. Mm -hmm. We're going to put the loan in your name because you're a first time home buyer. You get called a first time home credit. Gotta be strategic because even when it comes time to sign a mortgage, my name's still gonna be on it, even if I'm not on the mortgage. My name is still gonna be on the house. Right? And so you gotta be strategic and find somebody that wants to have the same goals. We said we both don't wanna be working at 80. We don't wanna, we wanna be financially free. We, we wanna travel the world. We literally said that we want to travel the world. And God has blessed us to do 32 countries. Oh, we've been 32. 32. And some of which multiple times. Uh, anywhere from 8 to 15 times, some of them. So, you know, you could still live, still save for your future, but, you know, but you got to live within your means. So just because we can right now go out and get an even bigger, better, better house than we have now does not mean we go do it. Right. Amen. <laughs> so for me, I'd rather have multiple houses at mediocre size in multiple places and countries than to sit on some giant house right here. So what he said to y'all, we're going to have a house in another country if y'all want to rent it out for a week. Let us know. <laughs> but you know, and I'm going to tell you some things that, some mistakes that, I, I don't know, we made it was mainly on me and I'm on this side. He's never heard it. If I could do my wedding all over again, I would. We spent so much on our wedding. For people to be spectators. Who didn't even really like me. Just wanted to see if we were going to go through it, right? We had, if you were at our wedding, it was at the Rosen. It was $70 a plate. No, 81. 81 a play. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was $81 a play. His mom was like, don't forget your mom. I ain't talked to that lady in 10 years. You know, people trying to ask her. People asking us to get on the, the list and didn't show up. So we lost, I think about 10 to 12 people didn't show up. So that's almost $1,000 we lost. If I could do it again, I would have a smaller wedding. Yeah. We had 225 guests at the reception, by the way. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a trigger for her. <laughs> and at the actual wedding, it was about three, four hundred people. So, and yeah. you think that if I invite that people, that many people are going to get nice gifts, right? Yeah. You get checks for twenty-five dollars. Like this doesn't even cover your plate. That's the protocol. Cover your plate. But um, and there's people that was I wanted to be the people that were superintendents and pastors, give me twenty-five dollars, and I was like. I didn't serve your young people all these years, but um, I would I would do a destination wedding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two reasons: one, I love travel. It's gonna be beautiful. Yeah. And the people that really love you are going to be there because they have to make a sacrifice to get there. Right. If I could do it all over again, we would have went to probably Jamaica, Mexico, somewhere that we had we had been there yet, somewhere. Because the people that needed my mom and dad, I'm gonna help my mom and dad get there. But my mom and dad flew down to Florida and they made it. Um, I would do it. I would not have a huge wedding. And so when I'm invited to weddings, like I was one of my sorority sisters got married. She said, "I'm sorry, I can't invite your husband because he was not mad. We understand." She had seven. She's like, "And I wish we would have did that another wedding." You know, if like somebody said, "Hey, we can only invite you to the wedding, not the reception." It's okay. <laughs> Do not go into debt trying to have the wedding that people are just going, oh, this is the wedding here for what? Is it going to be the marriage of a lifetime? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There you go. Say it. Mm -hmm. Like, we, we try to, you know, be bigger than everybody. I just wish I could have done it over again. But it's too late. You live and you learn. I'm not going to have it. Oh, yeah, we're going to get this. We are going to have a destination. Destination wedding. Or we're going to renew our vows at a destination. I said 10, right? But then 10 can't quit. It'll be 15 this year. 15 this year. Married 15 years this year. So 20. We're going to do it at 20. Then it's gonna go to 25. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need an excuse to travel, y'all know that. So we, we start planning now. And so, and with the way we budget, we're able to help our families. You know, I know that that's what something I wanted to do. Yeah. Amen, amen. Let's wrap this up. Let's thank, for, thank God for passing. <laughs> Come on, Holy Church, Church of Christ. Yes. Thank you, Tamia. Thank you, Pastor and First Lady. Love this conversation so much. Just truth. Um, so Tamia asked me to share my proud moment. 
<laughs> so uh, I just wanted to share that uh, for me, um, in 2016, the Lord uh, called me out of my career as a corrections officer for 14 years uh, to go into a call center. None of that made economical sense at the time, but Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. At the time, um, the position that I was working as a correction officer took me away from my family. And I had asked the Lord to give me, I needed eight to five weekends off. I needed to go to church on Sunday and I needed to be able to spend time with my family. Uh, this position was at a large insurance company and it gave me the opportunity to do just that. Um, I wasn't going to lose too much money, but 50 cents an hour, pretty much. So I go to the insurance company and um, the Lord took me from making pennies to walking into my purpose in that, in that area. So the insurance company actually uh, hired me as a call center representative and then began to open my eyes to the, the world of insurance. Um, in 2016, when I went there, I stepped out on faith, I left a career that I knew, and I was able to um, transition very well into the insurance company. Since I've made that move, I've tapped into my life purpose as a coach um, and really being able to minister uh, to people who are hurting, um, especially families. Financially, it has been a, a, a major uh, come up in my life because I went from payday loans to um, living paycheck to paycheck to receiving bonuses, raises, and promotions pretty much every year since I've left the corrections field. Um, I'm expecting a big move of God next, but I want to say that had I stayed in corrections, I was looking to earn 50 cents more every year. But since I've gone to the insurance field, thousands and thousands of dollars per move, I mean, I was making like 30 to like 40 to every year. It was like a 10, $15,000 raise every year. And my faith in God increased because I knew that in the natural, it didn't make sense to leave a career that was comfortable to go to a call center. But that call center opened up the door for me to walk into uh, being faithful to God on Sundays, um, to being able to actually find a church home, to walk in ministry as an evangelist missionary now, and also walking into purpose as a coach because they hired me as a health coach, and then I found out that I had a passion to be a life coach, and now I can I have my own business as a life coach now, ministering the gospel to hurting families. And so, uh, it's not going to always make sense to man, but do what God has said and be faithful to what He has told you to do, and you'll see that uh, He'll blow your mind. But he will also tap you to a level of purpose when you walk into like just being sensitive to him. Um, and so I'm grateful and I'm glad for my, my um, the increase. I know that had I remained in corrections, I might have been divorced. Uh, my children might be in jail. Um, I, I saw my life going in a different direction, but because I yielded to the Lord, I saw not only he restored my life, but he restored the lives of my family members. And that's just my testimony. If I tell you what he did to my husband, mm. that will take another 30 minutes. But I just want to thank the Lord for uh, allowing us to be a vessel. And one of the things that I do know that as far as the tithe is it has been very challenging for us to be consistent with tithe. And I remember being you know, very aware that I needed to do the tithe and my husband wasn't in agreement. He didn't understand it. And then somebody on his job testified about how she had been paying tithes faithfully and the Lord had opened, you know, blessed her. And then he came home and said, we gotta start tithing. So sometimes wise, <laughs> You might play to see, but God has to let somebody else water it. Let that happen because it did change the trajectory of our marriage. And so we are honored uh, to be able to share our testimony. I just want to thank Tamia. Did you have any questions? All right. So who's next? Amen. Amen. And at this time, I'm going to ask um, Evangelist Ruby Ward to come give her a um, proud money moment. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Uh, I should say that I've been blessed listening to uh, our speakers here today. Um, I just, I have one testimony about money. I have several of them. But I, just, I have one that I feel like I want to share today. Uh, some years ago, and by the way, I am retired. I'm fully retired. And um, I don't work except for the Lord. And that's the way I like it. Praise the Lord. But anyway, uh, several years ago, my... I used to work in a call center too, um, and my boss came to me one day and he says, uh, Ruby, I don't know how this happened, he said, but you and a couple of other people are not making even the minimal amount of money that you should be making for your knowledge and your skills for this job. And he says he doesn't know how it happened, but um, 
you know, sometimes these supervisors have their little picks and clicks, you know, and they might tell you, we, we're not giving but so much money to everybody, but actually they're giving more to their people. Anyway, I didn't know about it, but see, God has a way of opening your eyes and letting you know what's going on around you. And so, um, when he told me that, he says, but I already spoke to um, his supervisor and they agreed that we were going to get our money in the next check. It never came in the next check. So he says, well, let me know if you don't get it. And I went back to him and I says, well, it wasn't in my check. So he says, well, it's probably held up in Dallas somewhere at headquarters. He says, but, you know, it, when they release it, uh, you get it. I said, okay. And I'm a pretty patient person. <laughs> Not bragging on myself, but I've just been a little bit too patient all of my life. I've just been patient with people. And, and so I waited and waited. And I finally went back to him one more time. And the third time, he would answer with an attitude. He says, well, when Dallas release it, if they ever do, then you'll get it. And I felt very discouraged when he told me that, you know, because this was money that was due me. So I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, I could really use that money now. And this was years later. So I said, well, you know what? I'm going to see what a lawyer has to say. Well, I actually should have done that several years ago. But the lawyer says, well, it's too late now. He says the statute of limitation is passed and uh, you wouldn't be able, we wouldn't be able to do anything to help you. That's just gone money. So I said, well, okay, and I kind of put it on the back burner. But then one day I said to the Lord, Lord, you know that I work for that money. Always been a conscientious work, always did my best job. That money belongs to me. And since the company went out of business and moved overseas somewhere, it looks like they're not going to give me my money. But I know you got a way of getting me my money. Well, years went by. And then one day, I was, um, my client that I was where I used to do home health in the meantime, anyway, for um, temporary. And uh, my client passed away. And her, his son called me in the hall one day and he says, Ruby, we appreciate you and what a good job you did for dad and everything. So um, we just want to give you this check. And it was for ten thousand dollars. I said, "Wow, praise God!" You know, I'm so happy, and I needed that ten thousand dollars at the time. And so then, when my husband passed in 2017, in 2018, I decided, well, I've stayed here another year, but there's nothing here for me. I was in Oklahoma, and so I said, "I think I'm going to go back home." So I came back home to, to Florida, and. Um, the mortgage company from, from my house that I was living in never did pay the mortgage off. But anyway, uh, that's another story how God intervened in the money situation because my credit was not that good. But anyway, um, when I left my house there, the agent just said to me, well, sometimes um, when you're moving out of the area, when you move to another state, we give up to $10,000. He says, but now, you don't um, necessarily have to get that much, but we will give you something, maybe one or two thousand or something, you know. He said, they rarely get ten thousand. I said, okay. They gave me ten thousand dollars, <laughs> praise the Lord, when I moved to Tulsa. That, that was from my house. And, and my, my uh, real estate lady didn't even know about it. And see, uh, but I, I'm a very avid listener, you know, I pay attention to things, you know. And when that agent said to me, sometimes we assist with moving expenses, and he says, but they rarely get 10000 Well, I got the 10000 Well, talking about using wisdom, well, my husband, God bless his heart, he never did use a whole lot of wisdom. And we went to this dealership one day. I went to get a car. I had a Mercedes, and it was a nice car and everything, you know, but it was older, and things began to go kind of wrong with it. So he wanted to trade it in. So, but it's supposed to be for me. Well, we get out there, and he goes looking for a Cadillac for himself. And a car for me. So that was two luxury cars. I have my um, Lexus sitting outside now. Thank God it turned out to be a good car. But we couldn't, we, were, we couldn't afford that at the time. But we got him anyway. I was surprised that the man even approved it. You know? But, but he did. And so now when my husband, so we got the two cars, but my husband passed the next year. And the way that those people had it set up was that I was responsible for his car if something happened to him, and he was responsible for my car if anything happened to me. They just had it set up that way. And so, anyway, those people came after me for the money for, the, um, for his Cadillac. And I told them, listen, I can barely afford to keep mine. I, I, can, I don't have the money for the Cadillac, you know. I said, my husband passed. I said, the people, his, his um, 
a death certificate and everything. They still came after me for the money. But just last year, somebody called, somebody um, filed a, a class action suit and they put my name in there because they said the same thing that happened to these people. They got the car back, I turned it back over to them, they sold it, they got the money. But they still wanted to come after me for $10,000. So um, they won. We won the class action. They said, you don't have to do anything. And um, I, my name was thrown in there and we won the case and that $10,000 that I got old got dismissed. Yeah. <laughs> that was three Three, uh, that was three ten thousand dollars at three different times. So I said, Lord, what? I said, wait a minute, did I saw a big scene somewhere and I'm getting the, uh, the, the results here now? Or what's going on? And the Lord reminded us, because you know you lost all that money back on your job. He knows what year, but I don't even remember now, so many years ago. And that's your pay. That's your pay. And I said, thank God, so I'm satisfied now. <laughs> I'm going to ask missionary Brandon Taylor. I'm nervous, so excuse me. But um, I'm up here. I'm going to piggyback off um, First Lady. Pay your church size and God bless you. So a couple years ago, me and my husband, I married my high school sweetheart. When I got out of school, I got every credit card. So I messed up my credit. So um, my pastor had a guest speaker, his mentor, come to us and preach. He said, um, so what's the right on bike of your church tie in the low, what you want God to bless you for. I put a house, my daughter graduated from college, and my son to graduate from high school, but I had bad credit. My husband had no credit, and that's just like bad credit. So fast forward, we went and applied for a house, got approved for $300,000, but pandemic hit. So we got a house during the pandemic time, and I was like, you know, I'm tired of looking at houses. So we went into, I stay in Wildwood, but we surrounded by the villages. So some people think we stay in the villages, which is it, a good thing, because somebody, they want to buy it, so it raised it up. But when we brought it that Friday, it was the ninth. We were supposed to close, but something happened. So I'm tired, I told my husband, I said, well, I'm done. It ain't, it ain't, must ain't, no, we got in trouble, my husband, took out a loan, and whoever know that you're supposed to take out a loan. In the middle of closing. In the middle of closing. But guess what, we still got a house. So he took out a loan, and I thought it, I thought it was gonna affect us, so that Friday, something happened, and I was like, Taylor, that's my husband. I was like, you took out that loan, and maybe they're not giving us our house. I got this courage, it's five o'clock. And I was like, we're not gonna move, and I got this U-Haul, and we all set. We moved in our house before we closed. We moved in our house with a padlock on it. The realtor gave us a code to get in our house. Not too many African Americans stay in our house. So not only did we move in at nighttime, guys, because the person, his name Randy too, he was from New York. He had already signed because we wasn't together. It was during the pandemic. He was already in New York. He said, I already sold y'all the house. Y'all can go ahead and move in. So he gave us permission to move in, in our house. So we moved in with a padlock. We moved in with a, a, a sign in our yard and we like the only black people there. So I'm just saying this testimony to tell you that if you pay your church tithes and you faithful to God, he will bless you. And no matter what somebody else's story was, don't believe him because I moved with, before I signed, I signed that Tuesday, we moved that money, I mean that Friday. Mm -hmm. I moved in our house before we even closed on our house. I moved in our house with padlocks on our house because if God promised to bless us if we pay our church size, and that's my testimony. Amen. Amen. Positivity